everybody. Welcome. We are going to get started. I would like to welcome you to the American Constitution Society Federalist Society debate on the merits of the Supreme Court's Hobby Lobby decision. I am Caroline Fredrickson. I'm the president of the American Constitution Society. And for those of you who may not be familiar with ACS, I hope many of you are, uh, we are a national network of lawyers, law students, judges, and policymakers who believe that the law should be a force to improve the lives of all people. We work for positive change by shaping debate on vitally important legal and constitutional issues like the ones we'll discuss today. ACS is especially pleased to join with partners uh, the National Constitution Center and the Federalist Society at this event where we'll be kicking off a series of constitutional debates to be held around the country this year. To tell you more about the series and today's debaters, I'd like to introduce Jeffrey Rosen. He's the President and CEO of the National Constitution Center. Jeff is also a professor at the George Washington University Law School and a highly regarded journalist whose essays and commentaries have appeared in the New Republic, where he is the legal affairs editor, the New York Times Magazine, and the New Yorker, where he has been a staff writer. He's the author of several books, most recently, Constitution 3.0, Freedom and Technological Change, books about the Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, and President William Howard Taft are forthcoming, and we look forward to reading them. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Rosen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a great day for constitutional debate in America. I am thrilled to welcome you here on behalf of the National Constitution Center and to bring together these two great organizations the Federalist Society, and the American Constitution Society to inaugurate a series of national debates that I hope will rank with the Lincoln to the Douglas debates in terms of illuminating constitutional discourse in America. I bring you greetings from the National Constitution Center, uh, which is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And we are a be beautiful museum of we the people in Philadelphia, but we are also the institution that you see here in Washington right now. The one place in America in these polarized times that can bring together citizens from all sides of the spectrum to debate not political questions, but constitutional questions, and let you the people make up your own mind. We are devoted to debating, celebrating, and educating people about the greatest vision of human freedom ever invented, the US Constitution, the one document in these polarized times that binds people from different perspectives. And I'm holding up my beautiful National Constitution Center, Center pocket constitution, which has a riveting new introductory essay by yours truly and uh, David Rubenstein. It's just absolutely fascinating, and you can get it on Amazon. But I can't tell you how meaningful it is for me to be standing here to have just had lunch with my great friends, uh, Carolyn Fredrickson, Lee Otis, and Jean Meyer from the Federalist Society and the Constitution Society, and to share this joint vision that it's important in these polarized times to come together for constitutional debate. This was a vision that I had ever since I had the great luck to head the National Constitution Center a year and a half ago. I hoped that I could bring these groups together uh, for debates in every media platform. And thanks to a generous grant from the John Templeton Foundation, we're able to do just that. This remarkable grant has allowed us to create a Coalition of Freedom Advisory Board that's co-chaired by Carolyn Fredrickson from the American Constitution Society and Lee Otis from the Federalist Society, as well as Nick Rosencrantz uh, and Rick Pildes from uh, Georgetown and NYU. And it unites the top scholars in America from all perspectives, liberal, libertarian, and conservative, this advisory board will supervise the creation of the best interactive constitution on the web. So we're going to commission the top scholars from every perspective to describe every clause of the constitution, both writing about what they agree on, the settled law and history, and about what they disagree about, and we're going to distribute this to every school kid in America. 
And we're also, as part of this great initiative, sponsoring a series of national debates. You can engage them both here live, as you're doing now. You can listen to our great We the People podcast, which are now getting 350,000 downloads a week and are building a national and international audience. And you can follow us online. So this is meaningful. This is important. And this is a, a, a project that I am confident will elevate civic discourse and illuminate uh, constitutional debate. OK, with that uh, modest uh, plug, uh, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm very enthusiastic about this, as you can, as you can see. I'm going to introduce our great debaters, describe the format, which has been uh, jointly agreed to by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, and then, uh, as briefly as possible, summarize the facts and the holding of this complicated but crucial and important case, the Hobby Lobby case. Uh, so first, uh, let me um, introduce our great uh, debaters. Um, Frederick Geddes holds the Guy Anderson Chair at Brigham Young University Law School. He's widely published on law and religion. Uh, he's the author of two books, The Rhetoric of Church and State and Choosing the Dream, The Future of Religion and Public Life. He was principal author and counsel of record on a US Supreme Court amicus brief filed for himself and 20 other church state scholars in the Hobby Lobby and Conestoga Wood cases. He clerked on the Ninth Circuit and has been at BYU Law since 1990. Please join me in welcoming Frederick Geddes. We are also uh, have the honor of being joined by Kevin Walsh, who's an associate professor of law at the University of Richmond Law School. He teaches and writes in the areas of federal jurisdiction and constitutional law. His scholarship focuses on doctrines that define the scope of federal power. He's uh, joining, uh, ch chairing the board of the John Marshall Foundation in Richmond and is going to remind us of Marshall's centrality in American life. Uh, he clerked for uh, Associate Justice Antonin Scalia and for Judge Paul Niemeyer of the US Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. And he consulted for the plaintiffs in the Hobby Lobby case. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Walsh. In fact, let me ask both of our debaters to uh, come up and uh, join me on stage. And then I'll try to summarize as quickly as possible the facts of the case and describe the uh, format. So uh, the Hobby Lobby case uh, arose out of a claim brought by uh, the Hobby Lobby uh, company, which is a small business in Oklahoma City. Uh, it has more than uh, 556 stores in 41 states. Uh, the company is closely head held by family members. Uh, David Green is the CEO, and uh, his son, Stephen Green, is the president. The Green family believes that, quote, it is by God's grace and provision that Hobby Lobby has endured, and they seek to honor God by operating the company in a manner consistent with biblical principles. They argue that these principles were put to the test when the federal government in the Affordable Care Act mandated that the Greens and their family businesses provide four specifically potentially life-terminating drugs uh, and contraceptive devices, and they claim that this employee health plan conflicted with their deeply held religious convictions. So the Greens and their family business filed suit in September 2012, arguing that the contraceptive mandate violated their right to religious freedom under both the Constitution and federal law. The main federal law at issue here, and you'll hear a lot about it, is called the Religious Re Freedom Restoration Act. It was enacted in 1993, and it prohibits the government from substantially burdening a person's exercise of religion if the burden results from a rule of general applicability unless the government demonstrates the application of the burden to the person is in furtherance of a compelling governmental interest and is the least restrictive means of furthering that interest. Uh, so Hobby Lobby argued that the, these contraceptive devices uh, violated RIFRA because first, closely held corporations within the meaning of the statute uh, were substantially burdened and the health and human services regulations that the administration used to implement the statute was not in pursuit of a compelling governmental interest. In response, the federal government argued that RIFRA did not apply to a closely held corporation like Hobby Lobby. Um, and even if it did apply, it said that there was no substantial burden on religious liberty. So in a five to four decision last June, 
uh, the Supreme Court held that RFRA does apply to closely held corporations and that the regulations did impose a substantial burden and the contraception mandate did not satisfy the least restrictive means test. The majority opinion was by Justice Alito, joined by the Chief Justice and Justices Thomas and Kennedy. Uh, and there was a dissenting opinion filed by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. All right, those are the facts. That's a brief summary of the holding. Here's the format. Each of the debaters is going to give an opening statement of 10 minutes. There will then be rebuttals of five minutes each, and then we'll have a great question and answer period. So I'll ask a few questions, and I want all of you to write down your questions on note cards, which our staff will come and collect both during the debate and during the Q&A period, and they'll bring them up, and I will read uh, the, your questions, and then we'll have three-minute closing statements, and then Leotas from the Federalist Society will uh, send us off by telling about future events. Um, by mutual agreement, we are uh, ready to begin, and the first debater and opening statement will be delivered by Frederick Geddes. Uh, Frederick. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm grateful for the invitation from the National Constitutional Constitution Center to debate uh, this proposition uh, to ACS and Caroline Fredrickson for suggesting me uh, to take this side and to Jeff Rosen for uh, that generous introduction. I'm also pleased to be debating Professor Walsh, whom I like and whose work I respect, even though I often or maybe usually disagree with it. <laughs> Uh, when I first was uh, presented with the proposition uh, resolved, Hobby Lobby was wrongly decided, my first thought was uh, so many mistakes and so little time. Uh, so I'll get right to it. Uh, I'm actually going to start with a case from a few years ago. Uh, most of you may remember the Hosanna Tabor case in which the court recognize the so-called ministerial exception, which excuses religious con uh, congregations from complying with the provisions of uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act when they hire or fire clerical leaders. The court held that both religion clauses prevented the government from defining a Lutheran minister for a Lutheran congregation. But interestingly, the court was quite willing to define a minister for the ministerial exception and it would have been foolhardy not to. The ministerial exception relieves religious employers from significant liability. If the court's going to create an exception to the anti-discrimination provisions of Title VII, then it needs to police the boundaries of that exception, lest religious employers push those boundaries so far that the exception swallows the rule. It's certainly true that the court, or any court, may not define uh, the definition of minister for Lutherans, but the court and not Lutherans must decide who's a minister under Title VII. Uh, REFRA, of course, does not offer protection from all burdens on religious exercise, but only from substantial ones. Who should decide whether a burden is substantial and protected by the statute? Hobby Lobby held that the religious claimant makes that judgment. That's a very bad idea for the same reason that it would have been a bad idea to allow religious employers to decide which of their employees are ministerial and thus which are exempt from the provisions of Title VII. Uh, the Hobby Lobby Court, of course, would have had no business deciding the theological consequences for conservative Protestants of supplying emergency contraception in their health plans. That's not a judgment that the religion clauses permit any court to make. But the court can and it must decide whether a burden is substantial in applying REFRA. That's simply an application of the statute, deciding whether the burden alleged by a religious claimant is one from which REFRA affords relief. Now, no one disputes that Hobby Lobby is not burdened when its employees spend their after-tax wages and salary to buy emergency contraception. Why then is Hobby Lobby burdened, substantially burdened, when employees decide to use emergency contraception as part of a health care plan whose benefits they have earned every bit as much as their wages and salary? 
The court owed American workers, and especially American working women, an answer to that question. Now, secondly, this is Washington, D.C., where every time a federal judge, and especially a Supreme Court judge, is nominated, there's a certain kabuki play that, um, that occurs when that happens. And a crucial part of it is when the, uh, the nominee raises his or her hand and swears and testifies that judges do not create the law, uh, they only apply the law. And now I see that my notes are out of order. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, Hobby Lobby confirms, I think, that nobody really believes that, and certainly five justices on the Supreme Court don't believe it. Uh, the court saw things very clearly. The government uh, accommodated religious nonprofit businesses who objected to the mandate, so the court said, why can't you just accommodate secular for-profit businesses whose owners object to the mandate? What could be simpler than that? Well, the accommodation that the administration created for religious nonprofit organizations is funded by a tax expenditure. Uh, administrators of self-insured plans that supply contraceptives for free uh, when the employer won't receive a tax credit if they incur net costs. And of course, uh, uh, plan administrators of self-insured plans are always going to incur net costs. Uh, in a normal plan, uh, if the employer supplies contraception, then of course that's going to reduce uh, childbirth and other related pregnancy expenses. So it's easy to at least predict or hope uh, that the net cost to an insurer will be uh, cost neutral. The studies seem to suggest that. But when you're self-insured uh, and you're simply administering a plan that's funded by the employer, the employer gets the benefit of reduced pregnancy and childbirth expenses, but it's the plan administrator that has to supply the contraceptives for free. So uh, insurance companies uh, that administer self-insured plans um, are always going to incur net out-of-pocket costs, and they're always going to claim uh, a tax credit for those costs. Now, this tax expenditure was insignificant when the accommodation was confined to religious nonprofit entities because those entities only account for a very small fraction of total U.S. employment, substantially less than 5% of all employment in the United States. Closely held for-profit business entities, however, constitute 50 to 80% of total U.S. employment. How many closely held for-profit employers will claim REFRA exemptions from the mandate? How much tax revenue will the government lose now that the potential exemption base has increased by a factor of 30 or 40? Could be a lot, could be a little, no one can really say, least of all the justices. Now if the court were Congress, it could have held hearings on this issue, and if it were a cabinet department or a regulatory agency, it, would have had an army of bureaucrats to, um, uh, to research the issue, and there would be a notice and comment procedure to try and get some estimates and answers. Even the justices might have remanded the question to a lower court, where the government would have had an opportunity to introduce evidence and at least to respond uh, to this suggestion. But since Hobby Lobby had never suggested extension of the religious nonprofit accommodation to for-profits, as a less restrictive alternative, the government understandably never addressed it. So the court dealt with this uncertainty the way it always deals with inconvenient fact questions by assuming the most convenient answers. There are good reasons why courts don't amend laws and regulations, and the Hobby Lobby majority would have done well to remember what those are. So finally then, uh, the last error, at least the last one that I'll discuss, here's a question. Can the federal government force employees to pay the costs of observing their employer's religion even when they don't believe or practice it themselves? The Hobby Lobby majority suggested an answer, but it isn't the obvious one that I think many of you might be thinking of. The court's accommodation jurisprudence has always been preoccupied with religious exemptions that impose burdens on third parties. That is, those who don't believe or practice the exempted religion. And it's easy to see why. 
forcing people to pay the cost of practicing someone else's religion is a classic violation of the Establishment Clause, which was enacted precisely to ensure that the federal government would not force people to observe or to pay for a religion to which they don't belong. Like so much else, the Establishment Clause implications of REFRA eluded the court in Hobby Lobby, or at least none of them made it into the opinion. The majority flatly asserted that a loss of benefits that the government requires one private party to supply to another private party uh, is not a burden on the third party who loses the benefits, and thus shouldn't preclude a REFRA exemption. Now this was a dictum, so it's not part of the holding, but it's a dictum in an opinion signed on to by five Supreme Court justices, and so it's important. This is the Supreme Court yellow light. Yes, okay, I'm close. So if the Supreme Court means what it said in Hobby Lobby, a religious employer who believes that the payment of the minimum wage violates its religion cannot be refused an exemption despite the obvious burden on employees. What is the Fair Labor Standards Act, after all, except a government requirement that the employer supply benefits to the employees. Now, we've all seen this movie before. It's called Lochner II. We know how it ends, and we know why it ends the way it does. Employees once worked in this kind of laissez-faire environment, and the New Deal abandoned it, and for good reason. The market for labor is not really a free market. The so-called free market for labor leaves employees to be exploited and abused by employers unless the government steps in on their side. So, please conclude. There you have the three mistakes committed by Hobby Lobby. Believers should not be the principal judges of whether they are entitled to disobey laws that bind everyone else. Supreme Court justices should not be drafting and amending federal regulations. And burdens that religious exemptions impose on others should not be measured as if we, as if we were living in 1905. Thank you. Thank you so much for that opening statement. Kevin Walsh. Thank you, Jeff. And I'd like to begin by uh, expressing my gratitude as well to the American Constitution Society, the Federal Society, and the National Constitution Center uh, to show you that uh, uh, really, there can be cooperation among these groups. I, I'm pleased to report that when I lost my cheat sheet before uh, the debate, it was the American Constitution Society that uh, came through um, uh, for me. Um, so, uh, and, and, and let me just add specifically my, my mutual, re my, my respect for, for Fred. We've debated this uh, one other time, and uh, that was before uh, the case, and I won't claim credit uh, for the fact that my side won, uh, but now, uh, now we're a year out. In fact, it was a year ago today that there was oral argument in the, uh, in, in the Supreme Court case. And in fact, the reason I remember that is uh, one of, uh, well, well, my client in ongoing litigation is the Little Sisters of the Poor. They're continuing to challenge the federal government in this. And uh, Mother Lorraine, who is uh, our main point of contact in the provincial in Baltimore, reminded me that uh, today, March 25th, as well as March 25th last year, was the Feast of the Annunciation. Uh, now, it turns out that they weren't announcing their opinion. That came in June. Um, but we've had it for about nine months to, um, to, to, to talk about. And I think to figure out how this case ended and why it made sense that it ended as it did, we really need to go back to the beginning of the rulemaking process and actually back all the way to 1993. Uh, and 1993 was the year when Republicans and Democrats came together to agree on the fundamental uh, uh, viewpoint that Justice Scalia was completely wrong about religious freedom. So Justice Scalia had written an opinion for the court uh, that, uh, that contracted the scope of constitutional protection for free exercise. And Congress disagreed with this decision, and Congress uh, came together and, and passed a law that was co-sponsored by, in the Senate, by Senator Ted Kennedy and Senator Orrin Hatch. In fact, the final uh, bill passed by a vote of 97 to 3 in the Senate, and they didn't even take a roll call vote in the House. It, it just passed by voice vote. It was signed into law by President Clinton. And uh, this law, of course, is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, also known as RIFRA, right, R 
RFRA. And here's the thing about RFRA, okay? RFRA supplies a general rule for all federal law, right? Both the before RFRA and after, unless Congress carves something out of RFRA's protections, okay? And RFRA's protection is very simple. It's a rule that says government shall not substantially burden a person's exercise of religion, okay? Unless, as uh, Jeff mentioned in the introduction, unless they have a compelling interest and they've gone about uh, restricting or burdening that exercise of religion through the least restrictive means possible. This is a tough test to pass and deliberately so. And as I said, it's comprehensive, which brings me to uh, one of my favorite law review article titles uh, to describe the relationship between the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the rest of the federal code. A RIFRA runs through it. <laughs> okay, a uh, RIFRA runs through it, and it's cheesy, uh, but memorable, um, and, 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 and important, because when we talk about religious exemptions, sometimes it's easy to think, oh, those people are trying to get out of the law. Well, you know what? RIFRA is the law. Hobby Lobby was asking for the law to be followed, and this is a law that Congress can change, but the executive can't. And so when, they, when there was a rulemaking process to implement the Affordable Care Act's requirement of preventive uh, health services for women, okay, the executive branch was required to follow RIFRA. Okay? The contraceptive mandate itself, the requirement to cover all FDA-approved contraceptives, was in a regulation. It was not in a statute. This regulation uh, was uh, originally supposed to be drafted by HRSA. HRSA is part of HHS. HHS farmed it out to IOM, the Institute of Medicine, which is a, a, a private organization. IOM's recommendations went back to HRSA. HRSA led to rulemaking uh, that came out from HHS, DOL, and IRS. Uh, this is DC, so I assume you can keep up uh, with the alphabet soup uh, there. But um, here's an important feature of the regulation when it came out. They kind of got it right in principle. The, ki the kind of is really important though because it contained a religious employer exemption. And this is because the administration uh, recognizes, like I imagine most in this room would recognize that the government really should not be in the business of forcing religious employers to violate their conscience in the way that they um, run their business. And that was the principle behind the religious employer exemption that was in the regulation as promulgated. The problem was that this exemption was too narrow because the government decided, that is the executive branch decided, that religious employer just meant churches and integrated auxiliaries, things, things like houses of worship. It didn't include uh, my clients, the little sisters of the poor. Uh, it didn't include the University of Notre Dame. It didn't include a lot of these other nonprofits that are still fighting the government. So the blowback on this was not just legal, it was political and it wasn't um, Republican, it wasn't just conservative. My senator, Tim Kaine, from Virginia, former Democratic National Committee chairman, said, hey, you've got to make the employer exemption broader. Chris Matthews, MSNBC, said this is, this is um, too narrow. And so guess what? The, uh, when, when, when the Democratic coalition started fracturing, okay, the administration listened and they engaged in new rulemaking. And in that new rulemaking, they came up with the accommodation for the nonprofits that we've heard about. But this left a third category, which included Hobby Lobby, as well as Conestoga Wood Corporation and a bunch of other uh, religious employers. And they were left with the mandate themselves. And they were left uh, with three options, okay? The three options they had were violate their conscience and uh, provide the coverage that they could not provide uh, under their religion, number one. Number two, offer the insurance that they'd been offering previously and pay a fine of $1.3 million a day, this would have been for uh, Hobby Lobby, or $100 per employee per day. Uh, so this adds up roughly uh, to $475 million a year for Hobby Lobby. Uh, so that was option number two. Option number three was drop their insurance altogether, send their employees to the government exchanges, and pay $26 million for, for Hobby Lobby. Those were the three options. Well, understandably, they chose a fourth, and they filed a lawsuit. Uh, and, and the reason they filed the lawsuit is because they had no other choice under, under the law. And they had a really strong claim under RIFRA. 
And uh, the court's decision, as we've heard, really has three components. And uh, my friend on the other side has spoken primarily about the last two components, the substantial burden part and the strict scrutiny, the compelling interest, least restrictive means component. I want to say a word about the first part, though, uh, which is who can bring a claim under the Religious Freedom R Restoration Act? Because the reason that things weren't developed uh, uh, as uh, my friend says they ought to have been developed is because the administration put almost all of its chips behind one particular bet, that they could persuade courts that uh, corporations that seek to earn a profit categorically could not advance a claim under RFRA. And while there is much more that comes, the truth is, is in the lower courts, that's the only basis they could win on. And when it got to the Supreme Court, when they lost on that point, they were done. They were done because on the substantial burden part, under law, forcing a religious believer to violate their religion through the imposition of substantial pressure in the form of crushing fines is a quintessential substantial burden. It's not as if this idea of forcing people to violate their conscience is substantial burden is anything new to Hobby Lobby. Uh, this is uh, w well established, and we can, we can talk in the question and answer about what might not be substantial, um, but they had no chance on that. And they, they know this too because in the accommodation part, they're trying to get rid of the substantial burden uh, on, the, on the nonprofit side by uh, kind of rejiggering the scheme uh, a little bit. So once, once the claim could be asserted, substantial burden wasn't that hard. And the problem for the government is once you get past substantial burden, the burden shifts to the government. And at this point, I cannot agree that uh, it's the Supreme Court's fault that the government did not put in evidence about the cost of different things because the government bore the burden of satisfying strict scrutiny. It's the government's job to show that it has a compelling interest and that it's gone about that uh, with the least restrictive means. And that's not a matter of dispute about the burden. See, they were counting on the court just never getting to that point. Not only did the court not get to that point, they only achieved two votes out of nine for their position. This is the yellow light. All right, yellow light, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up. Let me say something about the, 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 the compelling interest and the uh, least restrictive means point. Um, the government can't claim just a compelling interest in health more generally. Uh, if they could say just sort of any good thing that they're trying to do is a compelling interest, then RIFRA would be meaningless and they'd win every case. Uh, what we need to hear is why the government needs to use private employers to go through them, through their conscience, in order to accomplish their goals, why they can't do it some other way. And uh, now that they're in the business of running health insurance exchanges, I think it's a lot more plausible to understand why they don't need uh, to go through the Green's conscience or the Han's conscience or any other family uh, that's running, uh, running a business. Thank you. Thank you so much for that opening statement. Rebuttal by Frederick Edith. Let's talk about crushing fines. $26 million, that's a lot of money, even in Washington, D.C. You know, Everett Dirksen used to say a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. But Hobby Lobby has upwards of 20,000 employees. It's costing them a heck of a lot more than $26 million to pay for their employee health care plan. So the idea that they were going to be driven to the curb and forced into bankruptcy by paying these fines, which actually are taxes, the Chief Justice told us so, um, I think is, uh, is a giant red herring, was certainly open to them to send their employees to the federal exchanges, which at least by now are functioning reasonably well, and they could have bought their health insurance there, subsidized by the taxes that Hobby Lobby and other employers would pay who don't offer health insurance. Now, the uh, Supreme Court refused to address that argument because they said that the government hadn't raised it below, and it, uh, because it's so correct about these things, um, wasn't going to address an argument that the government itself hadn't relied on. And yet, in oral argument, 
when the justices asked Hobby Lobby if the nonprofit accommodation would work for them, Hobby Lobby refused to take a position. In fact, uh, their counsel sort of dodged and weaved and said, gosh, you know, I need to think about that. I need to talk to my clients. And that's because Hobby Lobby had never suggested that as, a, uh, as an accommodation that would have satisfied them. So on the one hand, the court is not, at least the majority, is not willing to consider arguments that the government hasn't relied on, but is perfectly happy to make the government respond to uh, less restrictive alternatives that Hobby Lobby itself hasn't even suggested would be satisfactory. Uh, that's not how religious accommodation jurisprudence had traditionally operated in the courts. Uh, the government is usually not required to imagine every conceivable less restrictive alternative and then explain why it won't work. Uh, it's required to respond to the less restrictive alternatives that uh, the claimant proposes. And that makes sense, otherwise the government is in the position of proving a negative. Uh, and if the government can be required to start a new program, if that's a less restrictive alternative, then there's always a less restrictive alternative every single time. The government just spends more money. Let me just conclude with this. Why did the government have to run uh, health care reform through private employers? Well, if you think about this for three seconds, you know the answer. We've been trying for health care reform since 1915. And uh, every time this issue comes up, uh, the specter of socialized medicine is raised. And people say, I like my insurance. I don't want to have to go to a government doctor. And so uh, the administration uh, did something I thought was quite, uh, quite reasonable. They thought, well, we're going to have to reform health care insurance through private employers. And that's what it did. It chose a means of implementing reform that was politically possible. And there is something, well, it's comical, it's naive, it's troubling. For the court to suggest as a less restrictive alternative uh, means that are politically impossible. Um, I'll just end with, with this thought. So let's suppose that uh, the administration takes up a suggestion that was made in the opinion. Well, the government can simply supply contraceptives itself through a government contraceptive program. We actually have one of those. It's, it's title. Help me, Carolyn, title 10 or title 10. title 10, okay. Yeah, the very program that the that conservatives have been trying to kill since the Reagan administration in 1980 and have successfully reduced the funding for by 50%. No Congress in my lifetime, and I'm not that old, uh, is going to pass a government program and fund it adequately to supply contraceptives. The court should have deferred to the administration's political judgment. That's its job. Thank you so much for that succinct and on time uh, rebuttal. <laughs> and now, Kevin Walsh. Point taken. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do want to get, I think there, there are some really good questions that are coming in. So I'll just say, say a few words. And let me, let me start with uh, uh, my friend's point about the $26 million fines. Keep in mind, that was option number, I don't know, two or three um, after violate your conscience. One of them had the $475 million uh, fine. That was to keep offering insurance, and they would have had to pay $475 million. Another cost of the $26 million option, which is real money, is dropping your insurance coverage uh, entirely. Now, why does it have to be that way? Well, that's the government rule. Well, if the government wrote the rule that way, why can't the government change the rule? Now, if you were a lawyer for Hobby Lobby's employees, would you be arguing for the position that forces your employer to either violate the conscience of the, uh, of the employer, uh, which comes with some good things, by the way, um, Sundays off, uh, very generous pay and, and benefits. Uh, and that's option number one. Option number two is lose your insurance 
so that you could have coverage for four out of 20 contraceptive drug and devices. Uh, that is not a choice I imagine that most Hobby Lobby employees uh, would make. And I do think there is something to the idea that when we have exemptions, okay, everyone benefits in different ways because without the possibility of an exemption, even a narrow one, the contraceptive mandate as a whole would never have gone through, okay? It's, uh, so um, this is sometimes the, the price to pay, and I will not say there is no price. Yes, there is a price, and um, the employees can go to the federal government exchanges and purchase insurance there if that's their option. Uh, and if the government says, well, that's going to be too expensive, uh, the government can subsidize it. Title 10 is an interesting possibility when the government does have a re really has, has a compelling interest. Take something like vaccinations. Uh, we hand out free vaccines um, to people who can't afford them. The people who work at Hobby Lobby and have full-time jobs with benefits, uh, the government never showed that there was a problem of access to contraception for that population. And uh, that, I think, hurt the government's case. As for uh, other ways we could go about this, and I'm sure there'll be questions about how can companies have rights and things like that. Well, let me tell you, if companies don't have constitutional rights, I have a really good solution. It doesn't involve taxes or anything like that. We just go to the pharmaceutical companies um, that make the expensive IUDs. By the way, way more expensive in the United States than uh, anywhere else in the world. Um, maybe because uh, our system is not driving people to lower costs, but by paying for it is um, subsidizing higher costs. Um, but let's just go and force them, instead of the employers, let's, take, let's cut out the middleman and take it from the people that make them and just give it to the people that need them and leave the employers out. Now, we can't do that because of the Constitution. That's the law, just like the federal government couldn't go to the, these corporations and tell them, you have to do this even though it violates your religion. Uh, that's the law. Thanks so much for the, that rebuttal. I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I will read these great questions from the audience. Uh, this is the National Constitution Center, so I want to uh, pick up on the point that Kevin ended with and ask you both about the Constitution. The court's ruling did not engage the question of whether the contraception mandated violated the corporation's religious freedom rights under the First Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, do you believe, Frederick Geddes, that the mandate violates the First Amendment or not? Well, the First Amendment has a lot of clauses. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I know it's always disappointing at a debate to find the debaters agreeing, but um, I don't think the action here is uh, the controversy involves free exercise rights for for-profit corporations, uh, at least for corporations. Um, most religious nonprofits, most churches and houses of worship are organized as nonprofit corporations. In fact, if they have counsel, counsel would be guilty of malpractice if he or she did not advise the client to organize as a nonprofit corporation. So, the, so it can't be that corporations can't exercise religion because, you know, the, the head of my church, the corporation of the presiding bishop of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, I mean, they're exercising religion, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> So it has to be a distinction between for-profit and non-profit, and that might, as a matter of policy, might, might have been a good place to draw a line that judges could administer. But uh, there are problems even with that line. So I don't think the Constitution, I, I don't think the First Amendment or the Free Exercise Clause are really implicated here as much as the Establishment Clause. REFRA is just a statute, and that means it has to comply with the Constitution, and that means it has to comply with the Establishment Clause. And the danger suggested by the court in footnote 37 that uh, people may be required to give up legal entitlements that are generally available to everybody else in order to support the free exercise of their boss, I think, is, is very troubling. Kevin Walsh, does the contraception mandate violate the First Amendment or not? Uh, yes. I don't think we ever need to get there. 
Uh, in fact, in, in Little Sister of the Poor case and in others, we, are, uh, we have a First Amendment claim. I think there were problems, though, uh, not just under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, but also under the Administrative Procedure Act and the explanation that the government um, has given. Now, um, let me explain, though, because the, the First Amendment free exercise um, is one that I've had some difficulty coming to a con con conclusion on, but I wanted to not, I wanted to give you the answer uh, that I ultimately concluded. Now, uh, under a free exercise, uh, we look first to the neutrality and general applicability of the law. We say, are you targeting religion for worse treatment, uh, neutral? Uh, that's the neutrality part. And um, are you treating religious reasons for not following the law uh, the same as all of the others? Are you treating religious believers um, the same as others? And that's the general applicability prong. And I think to, to, if, if you can show that the law is not neutral or not generally applicable, right, the next step takes you to the same strict scrutiny that we get under RIFRA. And the serious constitutional issue here is the general applicability of this law. I would take issue with the description of uh, the contraceptive mandate as providing a generally available entitlement. When the government issued its regulations, uh, it had to decide which new requirements for compliant insurance plans could be grandfathered in and which could not. So a grandfathered plan, if you didn't make certain changes, you didn't have to make other changes, right? So if you didn't change certain things having to do with the premiums and other things, you could be grandfathered and you weren't required to follow things that, non, uh, that grandfathered plans didn't need to follow. So very technical, but the point is, as a result, at the time of argument in Hobby Lobby, there were tens of millions of employees on plans uh, that were grandfathered. Um, so it, they weren't... Uh, required to comply with the contraceptive mandate, but they were required to comply with other parts of the law, like adults keeping their children on for uh, until they were 26 years old, uh, things like that. And so it's the general applicability that triggers it. Uh, and once you're there, I just stick to the rest of my strict scrutiny. But I don't think we're going to have to go there. Speaking of where we're going to have to go, I want to ask both of you about the, squ the scope of the decision. In his concurring opinion, Justice Kennedy emphasized the narrowness of the decision and stressed that there were other means available to employees of uh, religiously motivated, closely held corporations to get the coverage. On the other hand, in her dissenting opinion, Justice Ginsburg warned that the opinion could have very broad sweep and that it could lead people to claim exemptions from a host of laws, including anti-discrimination laws uh, involving race and gender. Uh, Frederick Geddes, uh, do you agree with uh, Justice Ginsburg or Justice Kennedy? And does the, do the lawsuits filed since the Hobby Lobby case come down vindicate or not the fears of the dissent? I agree with both of them. Uh, Justice Kennedy emphasized that religious exemptions cannot unduly restrict uh, the rights of third parties. So from my side, that's, that's encouraging language. On the other hand, Justice Kennedy concurred in footnote 37 and in the entire opinion. And of course, if you follow, he used the words unduly, which, which suggests the undue burden standard of the joint opinion in Casey. And if you follow abortion litigation, um, all the good feelings that are generated by uh, the apparent endorsement of third-party burdens dissipate because it turns out that hardly any burden is undue when you're talking about um, exercising your constitutionally protected right to choose to terminate a pregnancy. So I would have felt much better if Justice Kennedy had concurred in all of the majority opinion except footnote 37, or if he had concurred in the result and then laid out uh, his understanding of the situation, because then his opinion would have been the controlling one. Uh, Justice Kennedy is not going to be on the court forever, and when he goes off the court, no one's going to care about his concurring opinion, because he concurred in the majority, and that's what the law is. Uh, as far as Justice Ginsburg is concerned, um, I think she's right as well. Uh, she's certainly right politically. Hobby Lobby has reinvigorated uh, religious accommodation legislation. Indiana just passed a Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Other um, states are undoubtedly going to pass such acts. 
and they're going to be interpreted in the way that Hobby Lobby interpreted the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So that's a, that's a really powerful influence. As far as anti-discrimination laws go, uh, Justice, uh, Justice Ginsburg did accuse the majority of blowing giant holes in the fabric of anti-discrimination laws. And the only response the majority had is that discrimination on the basis of race is clearly, or eliminating discrimination on the basis of race is a compelling governmental interest. And uh, no, uh, no exemption from those laws with respect to race will be forthcoming. Notably, they didn't say anything about gender. They didn't say anything about disability. They didn't say anything about uh, same-sex orientation or things like that. So that was a very, uh, I think, telling and discouraging response from the majority. Race is safe, but nothing else is. Kevin Walsh, uh, do you agree with Justice Kennedy that the opinion is narrow, or with Justice Ginsburg that it could have sweeping implications that call into question the obligation to obey anti-discrimination laws? Can I choose an option three? Uh, right, I mean, because here what we have is a, a concurrence and a dissent describing the scope of the opinion. And I think the scope of the opinion um, will uh, emerge over time. I will say time is the most important uh, variable in answering this question because it's not as if the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, is a new law. It's been around and it's been available for corporations to make claims, it's been available for other people to make claims. It has not turned into a, a, uh, a battering ram for civil rights laws. And uh, there was nothing really unpredictable about the Hobby Lobby interpretation of uh, RIFRA. I would be surprised to find 20 years from now that Justice Ginsburg was correct. And uh, of course, having worked for Justice Scalia, I was uh, often on the uh, other side, right? And I often find myself disagreeing with things about Justice Ginsburg. But as, as, as most people know, they are good uh, personal uh, friends and um, can, uh, 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 can agree about other things. And generally, Justice Ginsburg's dissents, if you look at them, uh, they're usually a lot more measured and moderate. Uh, there's a real difference, actually, in how Justice Ginsburg writes her dissents and Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia's are usually responsive to the majority opinion right out of the gate. Justice Ginsburg writes her dissents as if they're majority uh, opinions. And, and uh, it's just a difference in style that goes in all different ways. I will say that I thought in tone uh, and in content, this Ginsburg dissent uh, was uh, less moderate uh, than I, I normally uh, would, uh, would think. As for whether or not Justice Ginsburg is right um, politically, I, I think it's politic uh, not to comment. Um, there are so many great questions from our audience that I'm going to dive uh, right into them. And there are uh, some that are directed to uh, each of you and, and some for both. I'm going to begin uh, out of loyalty to the home team from a question by Kyle Singdahl, who's a student at GW Law School. Uh, and uh, Kyle asks, uh, Professor Geddes, um, assuming that the contraception mandate was a substantial burden, how do you respond to the argument that the uh, something could not possibly be narrowly tailored when the government could have provided, the mandate could not possibly be narrowly tailored when the government could have provided for contraception by means of a subsidy rather than by building, by, uh, building any employer, let alone a religious employer, by burdening any, any employer. I'm going to try my reading glasses uh, for the next question. Well, some of you may remember the um, argument just a few weeks ago in King versus Burwell, I think the case, the case about whether subsidies are available through the federal exchanges. And Justice Scalia, whom I assume reads the newspapers, said, what's the problem here? If we eliminate the subsidies, then Congress will just restore them. They'll just amend the law. And um, I mean, I don't know what world he lives in, but in the world I live in, that is not going to happen. Um, so the idea that there is some, that one can imagine a way in which the law can be more narrowly tailored, that it is impossible to implement politically. I mean, I think this is a real question. Is that an available, less restrictive alternative? 
because that's what the law requires. It doesn't require that this is a less restrictive alternative that would work on Mars. It requires that the less restrictive alternative be available in the world in which we live. Uh, the, the court actually itself is, uh, is quite willing to protect, to predict uh, political consequences and to build them into its decisions when it wants to. It did that in uh, the NFIB versus Sibelius case, the first healthcare case. Justice Ginsburg had argued in that case that, hey, you know, um, with respect to the Medicaid expansion, uh, Congress could just repeal the entire Medicaid program and then reenact it with these new conditions. And the Chief Justice said, oh no, you know, that would, that would be really messy and who knows what would happen and I don't think Congress would do that. Well, I think he was right about that and I wish that he had had that sensibility in, um, in the Hobby Lobby case. So that's my response. We can all imagine less restrictive alternatives in worlds that don't exist. The, the point is to imagine one in the world that does exist. Great. All right. Do you have a, a brief follow-up to that? Uh, sure. Okay. All, all I'd say is um, political possibility is not a workable legal test uh, for something like that. The idea that, that well, we couldn't get a, a um, government program, and so what we had to do is conscript, conscript um, r religious uh, objectors uh, is not one that has much traction um, in the law. As for um, you know, whether something is politically available, I'd say if we're talking a matter of expense, what we're really looking at is the employees in the universe of closely held corporations that have religious objections that advance them. And by the way, Hobby Lobby's paid a price. Uh, a lot of these um, employers um, have paid a price um, for this. It, it was not easy actually finding a law firm uh, to be local counsel uh, in the brief that I filed, in the um, amicus brief I filed in the Hobby Lobby case. These are unpopular positions, um, and so it's a small universe that uh, asserts them. And then of those, we're talking just the employer uh, employees for those who think that this particular coverage is so important that they should go to a government exchange rather than keep their generous employer-provided health insurance. So I actually think if you run the numbers, uh, it would be not uh, as expensive and certainly not anywhere near the amount of subsidies that are pouring into the exchanges uh, right now for other things. Great. Uh, this question is to Professor Walsh and then we'll have a response from Professor Geddes. Do you agree that the court got it right in the Zellman case that vouchers are separated by private choice from government action sufficiently that vouchers are not government spending? And if so, why doesn't that same separation created by employee choice mean that the employer is not substantially burdened in Hobby Lobby as a matter of law, regardless of how he feels? Quite a sophisticated a, a, a and very interesting question. question. Yes, it is. Yes, and so, uh, so, so the, the answer is yes, I agree with Zellman. Uh, and so let me just say what it is, and then I'll explain why this is different. Um, so the other part is this is different. Uh, Zellman w basically said when there is private choice, right, when someone receives, say, a government check, uh, that they is going to be earmarked in some ways towards uh, expenditures uh, for education. Uh, when they choose that and say, I'm going to choose it at school A rather than school B, it's actually the private party making that choice and deciding where it goes. So if it ends up at a religious school, uh, it was the private party choice um, that did that. So I think that would be a really good analogy if we were talking about the uh, pay that employees receive. Uh, right, where what do you do with your money? And Hobby Lobby is not trying to control uh, what people do with their salary when, when it comes in. Instead, the government is taking the terms of their employment, right, that, that pre exist and imposing a new condition. And generally, what we, uh, when we talk about the government forcing one party to buy something for someone else, uh, we're not, uh, and so it's, it, it's the government who's saying you have to provide this particular plan that has this particular coverage in, 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 in to be used in this particular way, um, whether or not that coverage gets used, okay, the employer has been forced to provide it, forced to buy something that they view uh, as objectionable. 
And uh, this would be the same if, if you had uh, an employer uh, self-defense requirement that employers were required to um, provide uh, gun ownership, uh, whether or not their employees took them up, which very well could vary geographically, uh, has no uh, effect on whether the government is forcing them under pain of law uh, to buy something for somebody else. That's really different from giving a check and saying you can use this at any range of these um, schools. Why does Hobby Lobby even have a health care plan? Why do so many employers have health care plans? Uh, that's because, well, I will say they're not, they're forced to provide health care plans in the same way that we're all forced to take the mortgage interest deduction. Uh, it's a win-win for everybody. Employees don't have to pay taxes on the value of the uh, health care healthcare plan they receive, which is considerable, and the company gets to deduct it as an expense against income. Employers are not forced to provide health care. They provide it because it's in their economic interest. It's a way to funnel compensation to employees outside of the tax system. Uh, in, health insurance is pay. Uh, I mean, under the logic that... Um, that, Mr. that Professor Walsh mentions, I mean, the government has to stop and get permission every time it raises the minimum wage because it's interposing itself in the employer-employee relation. Well, again, um, we've crossed that bridge. We crossed that bridge in 1937 when the court uh, decided, and I hope they don't re-decide it, that uh, liberty of contract and the libertarian conception of employer-employee relationships is wildly implausible and unrealistic. Uh, Professor Geddes, why are liberals interested in protecting members of the Native American church who insist on ingesting peyote, but not interested in protecting religious folks who object to contraceptive devices that amount to abortion? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think I understand that question. Okay, so I live in Orem, Utah, and uh, it's a nice place to live. And um, uh, I, ha I don't happen to have uh, a Native American church nearby. But uh, if they were to receive an exemption, in fact they have, they are exempt from, I think, class one drugs. Uh, Congress has granted that exemption. I mean, I, I don't understand, I don't see where it's costing me anything. Now there are some costs, I suppose, if you've, if you've got peyote moving in and out of, um, of a particular location, it's probably gonna draw the attention of law enforcement officers, if you're gonna be able be careful to make sure that it's used uh, ritually instead of recreationally and so on, but those costs are spread through my entire community. I'm not paying the costs, I'm not paying any costs for the peyote exemption but they neighbor, that my neighbors are not paying. And that's the problem, I think, with what the court suggested in footnote 37 uh, about what is and is not a burden. Uh, I agree uh, I mean, I'm a believer. I agree that religions are valuable and that society as a whole ought to endure some cost to ensure that they remain vital. But if religion is a public good, then its cost should be spread throughout the public. They should not be concentrated on individuals. And so with respect to the contraception mandate or with respect to any other legal entitlements, I don't think it's an adequate response to go to someone who's been denied the minimum wage or who might be denied uh, access to uh, uh, free contraception or something like that. Um, don't worry, uh, because you're making society better for all of us. It's just that you have to pay and the rest of us don't. I think that's the difference between the peyote exemption and the problems that we're dealing with after Hobby Lobby. Quickly, I think what's what's behind the question, right, is a sense that our views on religious liberty, not necessarily Professor Geddix in mind, but as a society um, in litigation uh, on the conservative side, on the liberal side, are really just a proxy uh, for our views on the underlying merits. And 
Uh, to the extent that is the case now, I will say there was a time when it wasn't, and that was when uh, RIFRA was enacted, and I think that was a pretty good time um, uh, on, on that issue. Uh, but uh, then again, I was in high school, so uh, it, was, it was also different uh, in that respect. But I, I think that um, something important happened during the legislative debate over RIFRA, okay? And, and this is counterintuitive politically, um, and, and, and that was, uh, that the reason that there was such bipartisan agreement across the board was because there was no picking and choosing as to who would be benefited. They were behind a veil of ignorance in terms of who precisely down the road would be having to take advantage uh, of this law. There was an attempt very late in the game to uh, change, uh, provide one set of rules, uh, different rules, worse rules, for a disfavored class of uh, religious liberty claimants, namely prisoners. And both sides of the aisle came together and said, you know what, we should agree on this principle and we should agree on it for everybody because it is good for everybody. And uh, I think that uh, when there are burdens that result uh, from it, I agree uh, with Professor Geddix that the public as a whole should bear the burden of paying for, for public goods. And if the government, which gets its money from all of us, um, had to pay for the things that it is providing to uh, other people, then that would be satisfied. So under the approach uh, that I'm, I'm saying, hey, the government uh, runs exchanges, they can subsidize these folks just like they subsidize others, that actually satisfies the criterion uh, that Professor Geddix uh, has offered. This question is to Professor Walsh. You keep referring to Hobby Lobby as a religious employer, Hobby Lobby is a for-profit corporation, not a religious employer. Aren't you conflating the religious beliefs of the owners of the corporation with the corporation itself? How can a corporation have religion? Yeah. It's sort of, uh, sometimes I conflate Ben and Jerry's um, with views about the environment, uh, right? And, and sometimes I, um, when I criticize corporations or when I hear criticize, uh, corporations criticize in moral terms, I sometimes act as if uh, they have a conscience, right? And I see this all the time on my Facebook feed when people are saying, you know, shame on Mattel for the way they um, design Barbie dolls to perpetuate gender stereotypes. Um, yay, Ben and Jerry's um, for the way that you um, advocate. The fact is that corporations um, do have uh, beliefs. Uh, now, that is a way of um, speaking that we all use and that we all accept in different ways. I mean, some of the most famous free speech cases involve corporations. And so uh, I don't think I'm confused about that. I think that uh, it is consistent with the way we talk about corporations uh, more generally. And there is no incompatibility um, between seeking to make money in your uh, job or your vocation uh, and being a religious believer. I mean, one of the, uh, in fact, a lot of the religious freedom cases are about employment, uh, unemployment compensation, uh, where, where people uh, lose their jobs because of something they can't do for their employer. No one ever said, oh, well, because you're seeking to um, put food on your table uh, the way that the rest of us do, apart from the government, which, which takes it uh, money, right, because you're trying to earn money, um, that there's something uh, different about you. And you don't, uh, you just don't um, have rights. And so as long as corporations can make decisions and they can make morally consequential decisions for religious reasons, then they can exercise religion within the meaning of the, uh, of the free exercise clause, within the meaning of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. In fact, one of the cases that the court is hearing this term involves a claim that a corporation, Abercrombie and Fitch, discriminated on the basis of religion we can understand, now I'm not saying whether they did or didn't, I don't know, but if, if we understand that they can do bad things like discriminate on the basis of religion, why can't they do good things like follow their re religiously informed conscience? I don't think that's um, confusing at all. I think that's what we accept uh, most of the time uh, in, 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 in ordinary life and in the law. Uh. Professor Geddes, Justice Ginsburg dissent pointed out that the majority's interpretation of RIFRA meant that it did more than restore pre-Smith law, but granted more rights to religious adherents than before Smith, even though the law is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Do you agree? I do. 
uh, one of the reasons that the support for REFRA was so overwhelmingly positive is because the history of Supreme Court exemption uh, jurisprudence had, uh, had almost uniformly denied exemptions that impose costs on third parties or exemptions that did not spread their costs over all of society. I mean, in, in, the, uh, in the 25 or 30 year period in which the Supreme Court was active in granting exemptions before they were abandoned in Employment Division versus Smith, they only granted exemptions in five cases. Four of them were in unemployment compensation cases in which the court said, you know, there just aren't that many Sabbatarians who don't want to work on uh, Saturday and, you know, we can all afford the extra five or 10 cents in our premiums that will pay that unemployment compensation for people who are terminated from their jobs for refusing to work on their Sabbath. And then the other case was Yoder, uh, in which an Amish community successfully convinced the court that they could provide uh, adequate substitutes for a high school education. And so they were permitted uh, to withdraw their students from high school without paying the, the $5 fine that they otherwise would have had to pay. So the background assumptions that Congress was operating on were pretty benign. And those assumptions all dissolved. I mean, um, it is not incorrect. Uh, and uh, I, I don't mean to suggest um, that Professor Walsh is being dishonest at all in talking about the overwhelming support for REFRA. But um, folks on his side of this issue don't want to talk about um, the Religious Liberty Protection Act and how that failed because only five or six years after REFRA was passed, uh, the left woke up to the fact that religious exemptions could be used to uh, bless discrimination, uh, to exempt uh, religious believers from really important legislation that no one should be exempted from. Our LUPA is this strange concoction that it is. It protects prisoners and it protects uh, uh, against land use decisions. That's because it was sort of the only thing the left and the right could agree on. Uh, and so uh, once it became clear that REFRA could do the sorts of things that the majority has suggested it could do in Hobby Lobby, I, I mean, if you were to introduce REFRA tomorrow, you wouldn't get 97 votes in the Senate. It wouldn't even get to the floor. Uh, it might pass in the House, but it wouldn't pass by much. A, a quick word uh, about... Uh, by way of agreement first uh, with the proposition that uh, RIFRA, as understood in Hobby Lobby, I think rightly so, uh, did provide greater protection than the whole body uh, of case law taken together. However, that was consistent with RIFRA. If you look, uh, go look it up, it's uh, available on the internet. Uh, they say in the uh, statement of purpose, they say to, to restore the compelling interest test as set forth Actually, in the two cases that Professor Geddix mentioned what, that, that, that were winners for the religious liberty claimants, that is Sherbert versus Werner and uh, the Wisconsin versus Yoder case. And one of the problems that Justice Scalia pointed out with the, uh, with, with the jurisprudence that led up to the case that RIFRA reacted against was that while they said one thing, uh, that is a compelling interest test, they were often and too often doing another. And so what the Supreme Court said in RIFRA is the, the Congress said one thing, and that's what we're going to do. Um, as far as times having changed, I would uh, agree with that also. I mean, not only did RIFRA pass 97-3, Justice Scalia was confirmed 98-0. to zero, And, and uh, that wouldn't uh, happen now. I'm not afraid, though, to talk about the Religious Liberty Protection Act. Um, and, and the reason why, if you listen carefully to the explanation of why it didn't pass, Right, the explanation was the left woke up. Now by woke up, I think it's fair to say that means realize that sometimes religious liberty would mean that they lost their cases. Interestingly enough, the cases that triggered the RLPA involved religious believers operating for profit. 
Uh, typically what we're talking about were landlords um, who uh, wanted some say in, in who lived um, in their uh, in, in the, the houses they owned. And so actually the RLPA, there was a, a, a brief uh, explaining how uh, what everyone assumed to be the case, even, even the left to the extent we can talk about that cohesively, um, recognized that um, the RLPA would have protected people who operated uh, for profit, um, and, and so did REPA. So not afraid. I uh, wish it had passed, but. We have, uh, showing what a sophisticated crowd this is, as you can tell from the questions, we have two questions on the Administrative Procedure Act, and I'm going to read uh, one of them. Uh, I, I think, uh, Professor Gaddis, you can start. Uh, I do need my glasses for this one because it's pretty technical. Um, was Hobby Lobby decided correctly but for the wrong reasons? In other words, did anybody challenge the regulation under the Administrative Procedure Act since the statute only said to provide, quote, preventative care and screening? Birth control is not screening and not preventative care, since birth control prevents the natural functioning of the body, unlike, say, high blood pressure meds to prevent heart attacks. And again, there are two questions along those lines, so <laughs> Professor Gettys. <Gettings. laughs> well, let me preface my answer by saying that when I was in law school, uh, when Kevin was in high school, uh, <laughs> I wish I had been in high school when he was in high school. Administrative law was a backwater. No one took it, and, uh, and I went with the crowd and didn't take it either. Um, very difficult to talk about uh, whether pregnancy is a natural condition or not w without being disrespectful to all sorts of different views on what it is. I'll just say this, that that's, uh, that's an issue upon which there is dramatic and deep disagreement in the United States. And uh, it seems to me perfectly reasonable for the administration to have taken the position that pregnancy is a good thing for people who want to have children when they want to have them. And that in order for women to compete with men on anything approaching uh, an equal plane, they have to have control over reproduction. Um, I, I think of all the many things that my health insurance covers, I mean, it, it covers if I'm hiking up some crazy mountain, that's what I like to do, and I break my ankle, I mean, when I go in, they don't say, well, you shouldn't have been doing that. Um, if, I'm, if I'm running and I develop sciatica and go in to see the doctor, they don't say, well, stop running. Uh, you know, so the line, the distinction between uh, sort of what deserves to be treated and what doesn't deserve to be treated, what is or is not a natural process, I don't think is as simple as uh, the premise of the question suggests. Now, uh, I'll just close with that and apologize to the questioners that um, I don't know anything about the Administrative Procedures Act except that I don't know anything about it. So. <laughs> well, thanks for that. And, and so when I, when I took administrative law, um, <laughs> Uh, I was scared most of the time, um, and, and that's because my professor was Elena Kagan, and, and, um, and boy was she tough, uh, really tough, uh, and, uh, but, but effective. And uh, on, on, on the APA, since I, I mentioned it earlier, I think the, the, the best argument, or one of, the, one of the strong arguments under the APA is uh, that the government never really provided a good explanation for the lines that it drew and why. Um, if you go look at the notice uh, of proposed rulemaking and the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, and I'll, I'll give you all the abbreviations, you know, sometimes they mention the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, sometimes they don't. When they do, uh, they mention it in about a sentence. Um, but to, to the earlier point about the government never had a chance to uh, explain how this would uh, affect closely held corporations, this would ne the government never had a chance, that's what rulemaking is for. Um, and the fact is they drew lines. 
And, um, their ex and, and administrative procedure is about explaining um, why what you're doing makes sense. Um, so a standard of review is an arbitrary and capricious. Um, and it's not super rigorous review, but you gotta explain what you're doing and, and, and why. And I don't think the litigation will come to this, um, but uh, I, I think that those um, claims are alive. As to pre preventive services, I share uh, the, uh, the uh, impression that there is great ambiguity and difficulty um, in describing uh, the, pr pr what counts as preventive and uh, what, uh, whether pregnancy is uh, uh, sort of something that uh, ought to be treated as a sickness or ought to be treated as a, a natural thing. I don't think it should be treated as a, as a sickness, but I do think that pregnancy, I have four children, um, I did not bear them, um, but I recognize that pregnancy um, has a lot of costs um, to, to the human body. And um, even, even if uh, the conception of a child is a perfectly natural thing, uh, and, and, and I don't mean to say that it is not at all, um, it, even that being the case, pregnancy has a lot of costs. And, um, and when it's unintended, um, it has uh, future costs. Or take something like um, the egg freezing coverage I mentioned. Uh, this is a very morally, at, at best, morally ambiguous um, kind of thing. Um, in terms of uh, where the government drew the line when it talked about preventive versus not, uh, I'm pretty sure this is true, that they did not include coverage for counseling for natural family planning. Uh, there, there's counseling for other types of things, and their explanation was that's not contraception. Uh, and that is a weird line, and, and I, I think um, it reflects something about the people who wrote the, the laws um, and their uh, worldview, um, because counseling for natural, natural plan, family planning uh, has really come a long way, uh, and uh, when used properly with counseling can be uh, effective, and the idea that the government um, excluded that I think doesn't make sense. That's not gonna be a winning claim for someone that's paying for um, all sorts of things like Hobby Lobby is, and um, so APA matters, but probably for different reasons. Great, well there are many other superb questions, but it is time, ladies and gentlemen, for closing statements, and then we're gonna take some straw polls. Uh, the first closing statement goes to Professor Gutter. Three minutes. Well, this has been a very rich and uh, interesting discussion. I, I'm again, I'm glad to have been a part of it. Um, Professor Walsh mentioned something earlier about uh, I think this was uh, in response to the why do liberals think this way question. And I, I think it's important, I agree with, with what I think was his response, that we've become polarized. Uh, religious liberty has become a partisan issue where one argues that liberals only care about minorities like Native Americans but don't care about traditional majority religions like uh, even the evangelical Protestants who own Hobby Lobby. Uh, I don't know that that's true. I do a lot of work with the ACLU in Utah, and they're perfectly happy to represent people who belong to traditional majoritarian religions when their religious rights are, are violated. But I, I, uh, I'll concede the point. Uh, it's unfortunate that people think that way, uh, and they shouldn't. But with respect to Hobby Lobby itself, um, let's think 10 or 20 years into the future. So let's imagine a world in which religious people are a kind of aristocratic elite. They're entitled to impose the cost of their religious practices on non-adherents. A world in which every believer is a law unto himself or herself. In Employment Division Smith, Justice Scalia warned that any such world would be courting anarchy, and Justice Kennedy agreed with him, and I think they were both right, and yet the Hobby Lobby decision that they both joined threatens to bring that world into being. Would that world be a good one for religious liberty? I emphasize again that REFRA is just a statute. It may be a super statute, but it is still just a statute. It was enacted by a political majority in the ordinary course of the legislative process, and it can be repealed in the ordinary course of the legislative process. How long will political support for religious exemptions last if their result is to allow some believers to impose the costs 
of their religion on others who believe and practice differently? Uh, I think we know the answer to that question, and, that it, and it's not an answer that suggests a bright and optimistic future for religious liberty. So I hope we don't ever see that world. Thank you so much for that. Professor Walsh. Pick up with the point about polarization. Actually, the Virginia General Assembly just concluded its most recent session, and during that time, I actually had the chance to work as part of a coalition. Uh, I was, came in with the Virginia Catholic Conference, but we worked with the ACLU on some legislation and actually got it defeated. It, it involved lethal injection drug secrecy. The very first case I worked on as a, uh, as a law student uh, was uh, well, you might think it wasn't that long ago, but uh, it was uh, 15 years ago, uh, was a free speech challenge to a Massachusetts law uh, that uh, had been opposed by the ACLU, and over time, actually, the ACLU fell off. That was a case, by the way, that led to the Supreme Court's unanimous decision last term in McCullen versus Coakley. It was a, a predecessor, but same idea. And so people can work together. Um, the amicus brief that I filed in the McCullen case uh, quoted uh, both liberal and conservative legal academics uh, uh, who criticized uh, certain decisions by the Supreme Court as reflecting uh, the views about underlying merits rather than the right view of freedom of speech. So it can happen, and I don't think that uh, uh, there is any danger, though, of the aristocratic uh, religious elite that uh, Professor Geddix uh, mentioned. I think that religious freedom is good for everybody, uh, that exemptions are often a good way uh, to go. And there's really no stopping point for the idea that says once there's a statutory entitlement uh, to have someone else do something for you, that other person, right, that has to do something can't invoke their religious freedom. The only reason that um, induced abortion was not part of the mandated benefits is because there was a statutory bar for, for that, and that itself was part of the political compromise that led to the whole law being passed. And so uh, compromise is not necessarily a dirty word. Um, exemptions are not always a bad thing. Uh, and um, I, I think that what really would have hurt is if Hobby Lobby had come out the other way, if Hobby Lobby had been forced in, to drop its insurance and to send its employees to the exchange as the price of um, honoring, its, uh, uh, honoring its conscience. And so I think the, the threat that, that I see is more the fact that it was a close decision. I don't think it was a hard decision. I don't think it would have been controversial were it not on a sort of so-called culture wars, a phrase I hate, uh, culture wars topic. Um, RIFRA's vision was a good one, and RIFRA was applied properly in that case. And actually, the world that I want um, for my daughters, I've got three daughters and a son, is one in which the government uh, honors people's religious liberty while it's also trying to achieve its goals. And the dystopia that I see would have uh, emerged if it had come out uh, the other way. Uh, but then again, this is a debate, and that's what you'd expect. So <laughs> I'll end on that. Wonderful. Well, you have disagreed, gentlemen, about whether or not uh, the Hobby Lobby decision is polarizing. But there's no question that this debate itself is an antidote to polarization. It has been meaty, it has been substantive, and it has been legal rather than political. And now it's time for the audience to vote. In casting your vote for or against the motion Hobby Lobby was wrongly decided, I want you to cast your vote based on your legal, not your personal views. In other words, after listening to the arguments of both debaters, are you persuaded or not that Hobby Lobby violates the Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, regardless of what you think about the contraception mandate as a personal matter? So the motion is resolved. Hobby Lobby was wrongly decided. Who agrees with uh, Professor Geddick, that Hobby Lobby was wrongly decided. And who agrees with Professor Walsh that Hobby Lobby was correctly decided? Uh, all, all right, um, I now want to ask uh, whose views changed as a result of the debate? In other words, who came in thinking that it was wrongly decided but changed his mind or vice versa? Who changed his or her mind as a result of the debate? Oh dear. <laughs> All right, in that case, I'll ask the final question. Whose uh, legal views diverged from his or her political views? In other words, who thinks the mandate is a good idea but that it violates RIFRA, or vice versa, that it's a bad idea but it doesn't violate RIFRA? 
All right, we have a little bit of divergence between political and constitutional views. Not a lot of mind changing, but an absolutely superb, auspicious, and inspiring inauguration for this thrilling series where we are going to go across the country with the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society and the National Constitution Center, and we are gonna have these debates. Uh, we're gonna do them in cities across America. People are gonna hear them online, and as a result, they are going to learn about the Constitution. They will be challenged to educate themselves, and we are gonna do great things for constitutional debate in America. Uh, please visit the Constitution Center in Philadelphia, see one of our 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights, but more to the point, this is the National Constitution Center. What you have just experienced, this debate that brings these two great organizations and these two great debaters together is what the National Constitution Center is, a platform for debate and education about the greatest vision of human freedom in history, the US Constitution. And to send us off uh, and tell us about our next debates uh, is uh, the great Leotis, Vice President of the Federalist Society. Uh, she's been so wonderful with Carolyn Fredrickson in helping making this happy happen, and I'm just so happy to turn the podium over to her. Leotis. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, thank you uh, to the National Constitution Center, and thank you to the American Constitution Society, and to Carolyn, and to all of our colleagues who have been working hard on this, including uh, uh, Kara and Lisa, uh, Kara from the uh, ACS and Lisa from the uh, Federalist Society. Um, uh, I, uh, in terms of what's coming up, uh, we have, a, the, the next two debates are going to be in Boston and New York. Uh, the first one is going to be uh, in, in Boston on May 12th, and the second one is going to be in New York on June 16th, uh, and uh, topics uh, and speakers to be determined very shortly. So uh, watch our webpage, watch uh, Jeff's webpage, watch Carolyn's webpage uh, for more details. And thanks again very much to everybody for coming and joining us in this exciting uh, series. Thanks, Greg.